Welcome to today's program, and thank you for joining us. I'm C. Virginia Fields, former Manhattan Borough President and currently the President and CEO of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS. The mission of the National Black Leadership Commission on AIDS is to educate, mobilize, and empower black leaders to meet the challenge of fighting HIV, AIDS, and other health disparities in their local communities. And on today's program, we will talk about New York City's Department of Health, its role in fighting HIV AIDS and other exciting initiatives that are being undertaken. New York City has the largest HIV epidemic in the United States. Over 200,000 cumulative HIV AIDS cases have been diagnosed in New York City since 1981. And in 2013, there were 2,832 new HIV diagnoses in New York City, which accounts for 85% of the overall number of people newly diagnosed with HIV in New York State. And out of the 2,832 New Yorkers newly diagnosed with HIV in 2013, 20% reside in the Bronx, 26% in Brooklyn, 26% reside in Manhattan, 17% in Queens, and 2% in Staten Island. So persons living with HIV are throughout the boroughs of, Man of New York City. 42% identified as black African Americans. So here today to discuss this topic is a leader in this fight, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis. Dr. Daskalakis, from here out, I will be saying Dimitri, is the Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of HIV Prevention and Control of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He received his medical education from New York University School of Medicine and completed his residency training in 2003 at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. He also completed clinical infectious disease fellowships at the Brigham and Women's Massachusetts General Hospital combined program. And he received his Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. He has been a career-long physician activist in the area of HIV treatment and prevention among LGBT people. So Dimitri, thank you so much for joining me today. And as I said, here out, you will be Dimitri because uh, I love to pronounce that one. Dimitri. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for having me on your show. I'm so honored to be here. And I really want to thank you for joining uh, me today. Now. People know that the Department of Health, Mental Hygiene is a very important department and agency here in city government as it is at the federal state level, Department of Health. So just tell us a little bit about the role of the Department of Health, Mental Hygiene, and when did it get changed from just Department of Health to combine the two? I think that's very good that we've done that here in the city. Right, so I, I wish I knew the answer of the year of when they combined Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I actually don't know the answer to that. It's good, it's, it would be a good uh, question, I'm not sure. But I can tell you what the role of the Department of Health in general is, is to look after the health of New Yorkers from a population perspective. And so doctors, I, mean, I take care of patients now too. I still see patients in, in, in uh, an office practice. Um, doctors take care of patients on an individual basis, but very often there are needs that aren't just about my personal needs as a patient, but my needs as a community. And so the Department of Health, really its goal and its, its mission is to look after the population's health. And it does so in various ways. I mean, a lot of what we do has to do with really good records keeping, making sure we know what's happening in surveillance, making sure we know what the trends are in people's health, you know, everything from reproductive health to tobacco use to alcohol to drug use, you know, to speak to your baby, it helps them develop their brain. So it's mm -hmm. we have a very broad range of what we do. So, you know, my little piece, which is not that little of a piece, is the Bureau of HIV Prevention and Control. And so what my job is um, in the department 
is to really look after the, the health population wise of people living with HIV as well as those who are potentially at risk and then frankly the general community who should just have standard of care HIV screening. And uh, the question about when did the name change, and I was thinking, I probably should have known that too, because in my time in city government as an elected official, I think it occurred during that time, but I think it made a lot of sense to combine the two because so often we were forgetting mental health. Absolutely. And how important that is to overall physical health. So that, so you began to talk about your role at the department. Just tell us a little bit more about what it is you do. Every day, my job is, right, it's a great question. Um, other than to speak to lovely people like you who do so, so much good in the community. Oh, well, thank you. You're very welcome. My other role is to really look after three parts of the Bureau of HIV. So our Bureau is made up of a surveillance branch, um, a branch that focuses on HIV prevention, and a branch that focuses on treatment and care. So I'll just go through them a little bit. So surveillance, that's our records keeping piece. That's where we get the data from really all over New York City about HIV. So we have an HIV registry and we get data about people who are living with HIV, new diagnoses, et cetera. So you were able to sort of go through this great recap of our data that you presented at the beginning of the, of the show. That's how we're able to sort of generate that data because we have an, a really a good group of people whose job it is, is to make sure that they keep track of records mm -hmm. and that the, the data is as clean and accurate as possible. A piece of that also is a group that's called the Field Services Unit. And this is a really a, an important part of what the Department of Health does in the Bureau of HIV that many people may not know about. And what this is, is a group of very dedicated professionals whose job it is, is to interview new people who are newly diagnosed with HIV. And they do that to learn more about what their risks were like, as well as missed opportunities, and more importantly, from a public health perspective, learn about who their partners were, either from the risk perspective of sex or drug sharing, et cetera, so they can also reach out to these people to make sure that they're tested and educated about other ways that they can prevent HIV. So that's one piece. Embedded in there is also some work that we do with the federal government, with the CDC. We have many surveys and surveillance tools that we work with. For instance, the National HIV Behavioral mm -hmm. Survey mm -hmm. um, and many other, and MMP, which is the Medical Monitoring Project, that really looks after um, what's going on in HIV clinics in terms of the care. So that's surveillance in a very small nutshell. I could go on forever about that one because of the work. <laughs> Um, our prevention branch, um, it's a little bit of a gray zone between prevention and treatment, and I hope as, I, as I'm at the Department of Health longer and longer that I make it more and more gray, since um, there is so much overlap between treatment and prevention currently. Yes. But right now, prevention focuses um, on HIV testing and on ways that we can scale up interventions to behavioral interventions as well as structural interventions such as things that you know encourage parents to talk to their kids about HIV risk programs that help people sort of engage with other preventative services HIV testing and then most recently a lot of energy in the last two years has gone into post and pre-exposure prophylaxis and now I definitely want you to come back to that because I yes, know that that is taking up so much of the time uh, across the country and certainly here in New York City New York State yep. uh, as a result of the governor's plan to end the epidemic or significantly reduce the numbers by 2020 so we're going to talk a little bit about that I would but, love to but you were talking about uh, prevention in general and I, I, I want you to also speak about it from the standpoint of communities of color sure. because even with the reduced rates in New York City we're seeing that uh, African Americans Latinos still are predominant have the are disproportionately impacted in terms of new rates and now women yeah no, absolutely. I think that when we look at the, this, the, the, our surveillance data, uh -huh. um, we definitely see that young men who have sex with men of color, specifically black and Latino, are at high, at, at high risk or represent a uh, disproportionate number of new diagnoses. Right. And frankly, the disparity in women is stark. So though we talk a lot about the disparity in young men who have sex with men, um, almost actually 85% of new diagnoses of HIV among women are in black and Hispanic women. 
and that's you know not even close to what they represent in in society. I mean, that's that's double or triple the number of you know proportionally the number of, of African American or Black or Hispanic women in New York City. So it's it, it is a stark disparity. Um, so a lot of what we do circulates around at least from the prevention perspective in that community, messaging around uh, around HIV testing and also messaging around interventions like PrEP and PEP, since we have you know, created documents that really target both men and women, and we very specifically try our best to sort of extend who we are promoting this to, to populations, not just your normal population that you'd expect to see, sort of just not like MSM going to some venue, like we really work to sort of get that information out to sort of places that in block us services and in block us mm -hmm. support, like faith-based organizations, et cetera. I think that right now, our biggest vehicle in the prevention universe is our New York Knows program, because New York Knows really embodies all of the governor's three pillars. And now you have New York Knows in each borough. Exactly. And so that's... And that was started under your uh, leadership. Yeah. Because I know the Bronx had it for some time. With Monica Sweeney, right. who was like just, I mean, Monica <laughs> really birthed this amazing thing. And, and we can talk about, I could talk about the Bronx forever. I feel like uh -huh. I could send them a love note because the Bronx is the model. Okay. Like they have changed their story. And so we're trying to get the rest of New York City to follow suit. Not that they haven't been doing testing, but the Bronx is this model of a jurisdiction that just said, we're going to get community-based organizations, hospitals, faith-based organizations, everyone together, and we're just going to test everyone. Mm -hmm. like we're going to make it just a thing, that this is like a community drive to do it. And that's the model now that the other boroughs knows how a base done. You, got, you better watch the Bronx, because like they're the ones to <laughs> and follow. And you know, they started in places upstate, just to interject, I was in uh, Buffalo recently, and they started a Buffalo Nodes. That's awesome. And so I said, oh, okay, now it's moving upstate, so that's a good thing. But I mean, that I think is part of the story with the way we interact between New York City and New York State. Mm -hmm. Everyone takes each other's best lessons and tries to sort of interpret them in different locations. So we learn so much from the state, they learn so, so exactly much from us. So exactly what are you looking to achieve from the New York now knows that we have it in all five boroughs? Well, I think there's different penetration of HIV testing in different locations. Okay. And so we know that we have, you know, each borough is like a separate micro environment. Right. And yes. it's like, it, it, yeah, you're, you're saying yes because you know from your your, your personal and block experience, it's a different world. Like you cross the border between Brooklyn and Queens and you may as well be in a different city. And so, and Staten Island, forget about it. Like that's a completely different universe than, than our But for our viewers, we're not saying we're forgetting Staten Island. No, no. Not by any means. Well, no. we're, yeah. we're trying to move more into Staten Island, especially with education and outreach and information of the type. Because I think we've kind of neglected Staten Island to a certain extent. And now that we have a, a nose there and we have the blueprint, I think this is a great time to really work Staten yeah, Island. I mean, we actually, you know what, an interesting story is that um, when we went to Staten Island and had our first New York Nose meeting with them, um, it was actually very small. And then we went out, this is part of what my work is, mm -hmm. we went out, I went to like a bunch of hospitals and a lot of community-based organizations personally and spoke to them and, and my team went out and we reached out to them and then the second time we did this Staten Island Nose launch meeting, we had a full house. And one of the things that we heard, and you're going to smile, we heard, we never hear anything about it, about HIV on the island. That's right. So let me tell you all the stories already. We were the first bureau, well, the first time that the Bureau of HIV uh, put up ads on the ferry. And we took out ads in the Staten Island advance. And we're looking at more ways to leverage some of the media that works in Staten Island to make sure that HIV lands in their perspective. But then the other thing that we're doing, which I'm really excited about, is a partnership with the state. As you can see, this is a theme mm -hmm. that we do have partnerships with the state to do things. Um, we're working with the Clinical Education Initiative, or CEI, and we're launching a end of epidemic Medi continuing medical and nursing education program on Staten Island in October. Very good. So if you're listening out there <laughs> and you're a medical <laughs> provider in Staten Island, October 30th, save the day, uh -huh. we're going to be offering five hours of great education, really putting the blueprint into action. So we're very excited about it. I know. I think that that is uh, uh, really going to be exciting because 
not only do they not hear enough, and, and, and I think it's important because for those of us who are in the business, we believe that there's so much information out there. We believe that there is no shortage of information about HIV, PrEP, uh, any other means that one you know, chooses to address uh, HIV. But there's still a great gap, I'm finding, just in our work as we work in 11, uh, 13 now cities across the country where we have affiliates. And uh, I'm amazed at the lack of information that people don't have, despite the fact we know it's out there. A hundred percent. And so what do we, and, and as you're going through the city and now the state more and doing, sounds like a lot of on the ground work here, what are you hearing and how can we address that in a way to move people from this sense of complacency to action? Well, I think that the blueprint's a really important step in that because I believe that the energy that this framework provides of saying it's not just that HIV is there and oh, the numbers are going down and things are looking better and oh, I'm not worried about it. I really feel that the blueprint that's, that has inspired the community again, not our community mm -hmm. of people who've been in the biz mm -hmm, for a long mm -hmm, time, mm -hmm. but the community of people who may not put this on their radar, the fact that we can inspire interest in HIV again and frankly, by inspiring that interest, get rid of what I honestly think is the main barrier to all of our work, which is hate and bias. And stigma. And stigma. So I feel that the fact that you and I are sitting here talking about HIV, the fact that I leave here and we'll talk more about HIV in places that have never heard it before and just sort of make it feel like it's a routine thing, but not only a routine thing, but a winnable battle. I feel like that's what's, what's changed, that I think we've been sort of lulled into this. Everything is okay, we have people on therapy, plenty of people are getting tested, things are fine. But the idea that someone has sort of added fire and said, you know, this is not about complacency, it's about a deadline. Mm -hmm. People love deadlines. <laughs> People love them, and now all of a sudden- Because we have an important one to meet by 2020. Right, <laughs> see, exactly. And so I love the idea of being able to go places and frame this and say, this is not just a walk in the park. This is not just uh -huh. us sort of supporting people's work and making sure that they're engaged in care. We're in this to win it and people are competitive. I mean, I'm competitive. San Francisco, are you kidding? I'm, like, I am personally competitive with San Francisco. I want New York City and New York State to do it better. Do they have <laughs> an initiative to end or significantly reduce the numbers in San Francisco on a timetable as we have here in the state? They do, they have getting to zero. By? Um, I think they're also 2020 is their 2020. magic number too. So you see, it's a race to the finish. A race to the finish. So and that's the kind of stuff you love. Wonderful race to be in because yeah. now, you know, as we think about uh, what now over 30 years since the Center for Disease Control made its first public uh, release with respect to HIV and the number, unfortunately, of persons who've lost their lives and are still living with uh, HIV or AIDS, at least they have a better opportunity for an improved quality of life through antiretroviral treatments and yeah. so forth. But just talk a little bit more then about PrEP now, sure. which is on the other side, the prevention side, yep. and something that I know you're doing a lot of work around. We are doing so much work around it. And actually one of the exciting things is that we've embedded PrEP as part of the mission of New York Knows, which I think is an, a, a, an interesting change. And so one of the things that we as a department and as mm -hmm. a bureau are really promoting, and I think it's gotten national attention, is that the HIV test is not just important if it's positive, that it's equally important if it's negative in someone who's at risk. Because especially, and again, this is a very New York specific statement. If we were sitting in Fulton County or another part of the, uh, of the US, it would be a different conversation. We have so many ways to lead people to health coverage and why is health coverage important? Not so much because it's the only thing that supports health, but it's one of the sort of keys that unlocks the door and then allows you to access services and referrals out to community-based organizations and other things beyond the circle. So it's, it's this great moment where this negative test can also lead to real interventions. And one of the interventions, though not the only one, is pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP.
And so I'm just going to speak to you. I, I'm speaking to the choir. You know all about it. But no, but you're speaking to our uh, I know. viewing audience, and most of them don't know about it based on the number of questions that we can. So, just so we'll tell, tell them together. Tell them. So <laughs> pre-exposure prophylaxis is a medicine that one can take one time a day, and it prevents HIV. Is it for everyone? Not necessarily. It's for people who are at risk for HIV, and that really is a little bit in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, for instance, some men who have sex with men may be at risk. Some transgender women and men may be at risk. Some women may be at risk. Women who have a partner who's HIV positive or at risk for HIV could consider PrEP as well as, you know, everyone else that I've listed. So. It's a pill that people take once a day. It's actually an HIV medicine. It's a fixed combination of a medicine called tenofovir and emtricitabine. That's fancy speak for Truvada. I don't like to use a brand name very much, so I'll just call it PrEP from now on, but people should know what that drug mm -hmm. is. Um, and so this is something that the data, the evidence support, medical evidence supports that it works. In some studies, it can prevent HIV in over 90% reduction of risk. That doesn't mean people have a 10% chance of getting HIV. It just means that whatever their risk is, it reduces it further by 90%, which mm -hmm. is huge. If we had a vaccine that was 90% effective in preventing HIV, there'd be a line all around the block. Maybe, maybe, maybe past Staten Island to get the, on the ferry um, to get the vaccine. And so it's a really important step for people at risk. And so PrEP is something that you have to be engaged in care, which is a great thing. So you have to see some kind of clinician. Very often, um, wonderful places that you support will be places that will teach folks about PrEP and bring them to that idea um, and lead them to, to centers that provide PrEP. That's part of what we're doing, along with New York State, is creating a list of providers that people can uh, access to see where they can get PrEP. It's actually on our site locator at nyc.gov. But one of the things that I'm seeing, even as I certainly move around New York State, the yep. profile is still basically white, male, middle income, or black middle income, but not the population that we often talk about mostly at risk. So we still have a lot of work to really get the message and the information to, to remove some of the questions and the fears that uh, seem to be raised among that population. And that's an area of great collaboration because I feel that, you know, the Department of Health can message so much and then some of it comes from the community sort of organizations that, that, that these folks access, which I think is so critical. But I'll tell you, one of the, a couple of the things that we're doing um, to help with the prep story, especially to get it to the right people, is um, we did and will and plan in the future to do more what we call public health detailing. Mm -hmm. So we actually hired five former pharmaceutical reps and we created an action toolkit, which by the way, many jurisdictions are now taking, which is amazing. Um, and this action toolkit was delivered to medical practices all over the city, five boroughs, um, and taught providers how to do PrEP, and PEP actually, and post-exposure prophylaxis. And the way that we designed it in terms of where these folks went was we looked at where the new HIV diagnoses were happening. Very good place It was surveillance-based. So it wasn't just random and said, oh, we need to visit this clinic and that clinic. No, no, no. We said, where are people getting diagnosed with HIV? And as you would expect, based on the very data that you showed, mm -hmm. many of those new diagnoses were among African-American, Latino men and women. So it's on purpose that we did that. And I'm glad to hear that. Now, yeah. we only have a few more minutes okay. left, and obviously you are a wealth of information. We're going to ah. have to have you back when you do the entire hour of show. But because you've covered so much, I want you to just for the f couple of minutes, yeah. talk to our viewers about what it is that they can actually take away or feel empowered with respect to prevention, getting tested, treatment, and where, where, where's the best place to go, not necessarily the best place to go, but important place to go for information. Great, so I'll start off with information. Um, there's a lot of spots for information. I'm sure you have a lot of information <laughs> at Mblocka, so I should plug in Mblocka as one place. But then also nyc.gov, and if you just put in the search engine HIV, the entire universe opens up. If you wanna learn more about PrEP, put HIV in PrEP, and those you'll learn all about, about all of our resources for those. In terms of the message, 
I have a couple of messages that are important, but they mm -hmm. all come from the same thing, which is that, and I really believe this in my heart, that the only way we're gonna end this epidemic is through love. And what love means for me is really dealing with stigma, with hate, and with honesty. And so I feel that one of the most important messages is talk about HIV. It's, hmm. not, a, it's not a plague. It's something that we can treat. It's something that we can keep people supported and it's something that we can prevent. And get your friends tested, encourage the testing. If you are in, an, this is my favorite thing and you've heard me say it before. If you're in an organization that has nothing to do with HIV, but it brings people together, talk about HIV in it for a minute. And we don't do enough of that. We don't. Certain. It's like, it, it's, it's preaching to the choir. And so we need to get outside of that choir and into different ones. Because I do believe that, you know, we'll end the epidemic with love if we deal with stigma against uh, people of color, against LGBT people, against women, sort of deal with the, that issue and sort of look at it from the perspective of honesty and truth, talk about risk, talk about HIV, and just tell your best friend, your sister, your brother, your husband, your brother, did you get your HIV test this year? And that's going to be another show that I really would love to have you come back because I don't think we spend enough time on just that um, human side yeah. of it. Uh, we have the research, we have the data, we have the numbers, but just being very you know, personal as you've come to do in this last segment here. I think that's, that's a good way to try to reach some of our audience. But So we will have to have you back. And uh, you know, I think you've done a great job in Thank terms you. of informing our general viewers about what it is the Department of Health, Mental Hygiene is doing and what you're doing. So I really want to thank Dr. Sakalakis for joining us today and um, talking about the Department of Health and mental hygiene. And for more information on this subject and issues related to work on HIV AIDS and other health disparities, please visit In Blacker's website at www.nblca.org or look for us on Facebook and Twitter. The Manhattan Neighborhood Network brings these programs to you to better inform you, the viewers about the important topics that impact your health and well-being. So please let your family, your friends, and your neighbors know about this programming. Again, I'm C. Virginia Fields, and I thank you for joining us, and hope you'll tune in next time for In Blackers Health Action TV here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network.